Hi, it's Lee from ColouringQueen.net and today is Halloween day in Australia and the weather has really turned it on for me. There is lots of high winds making spooky noises in the background. It's not me doing that, it's not special effects. So if you can hear it, it is blowing a gale. Last night it, we thought that we had missed a big storm that uh, had hit most of Brisbane and then it tumbled down and hailed and all sorts so and today we're seeing this really strong winds it's knocked off all my plants and my little greenhouses that i set up they're all on the ground and everything is just getting blown away here today so my apologies if you hear the wind in the background we'll just call it extra halloween spookiness and be done with it so Today I thought we'd do coffee, crime and colouring and it's the last day of the month and as per usual I'm running late and behind schedule. I'm going to colour in from the other side of the dream by Carolina Kubikowska uh, in the new English imprint of the book and I'll put a link up above if you want to check out the review of that. I love Carolina's art. I always say if I was ever in Poland and I wanted a tattoo Carolina would be the one that I would go to uh, because she's a tattoo artist and I would let her ink me and I sort of think yeah the little girl from Ticket to Dreams with a bunny rabbit that'd do me but I just have no idea where I would put it and when I would get to Poland which is a shame because it's one of the places that I actually haven't been to so I wouldn't mind going there even if it was just to get a Carolina tattoo that'd be worth it so I hope you guys are doing really well today. I've been out in the garden you know, this morning and these high winds, I don't know about you guys, but they've given me a shocking headache. I think it's sinus or I don't know, just something with the high winds and the extreme hot. Like yesterday we were in the pool and we were trying to get Buddy to come into the pool, but he's still shy. He'll go in the ocean, but he's shy about getting in the pool for some reason. But uh, we haven't tempted him yet. His previous owner said that he loved being in the pool, but we're not seeing that love yet. <laughs> but hopefully he'll get in there soon. And please excuse me, I'm having a coffee as well. But it is called Coffee, Crime and Colouring, so, you know, I'm at least having the coffee. So let's dive into today's story and it takes place on October 31st, 1955, Halloween Day. So people in the US were listening to Love and Marriage by Frank Sinatra. Do you remember that song? I still remember it and I wasn't even born then. Uh, kids were watching Davy Crockett on Disneyland and it was also a really popular costume for Halloween that year. I actually wondered if Halloween was uh, in place in 1955, but some research told me it was. And trick-or-treating had just become the thing uh, in about 1955. It was actually after the 1952 Donald Duck cartoon, Trick or Treat, and that sort of reached millions of people worldwide and in it Uncle Donald gave out candy instead of the explosives he'd first put in their treat bags of Huey, Dewey and Louie and the candy companies thought hey this is a good idea we should market this and they really jumped on board with that and then now we've got trick-or-treating although in our neighborhood there is only one house that is decorated today for Halloween and they've done a whole maze through the house. They do something really good every year, to be honest. Um, they've made the whole house like a whole Halloween fest, like something out of Modern Family that Claire does. And it looks fabulous, but they're the only ones in our immediate area. I haven't seen anyone else with Halloween decorations. And it's kind of my thoughts that everyone's saving themselves for Christmas here because the borders have reopened and everyone wants to see their family that they haven't seen for a couple of years. Well, I know that's what we want. But anyway, back to 1955. It takes 
the crime takes place on Halloween, but it's it's not a Halloween uh, spooky crime. There's no deaths or murders or anything like that. So Jerry and Marilyn Damon had moved from Iowa to East Meadow, which is in Long Island, New York. And that was because of Jerry's work in the Air Force. He worked at Mitchell Air Force Base in Uniondale. And they had a son, Stephen Damon, who was born on the 15th of December 1952. And he was two going on three years old. Strawberry blonde hair, blue eyes, the all-American little boy. They also had a baby girl, Pamela, who was just seven months old. So on the afternoon of Monday, October 31st, 1955, Marilyn dressed her son in blue dungarees, a blue shirt, red sweater with blue and white chips on the front and brown shoes and put a young baby daughter in the stroller for a trip to the fair food market on Front Street in East Meadow, Long Island. And it was only a block and a half away from home, so they just walked up there. Once she got to the store at 2.45pm, she parked the baby carriage out the front of the store with Pamela strapped inside. Stephen was told to stay next to the carriage and be good and he was given some jelly beans to keep him amused while he waited. At the time it was quite common to leave strollers outside particularly in small towns like East Meadow. Back in those days the strollers were quite bulky, they were heavy, they were cumbersome and they were very difficult to manage in the smaller size stores of the day. They weren't like the big supermarkets that we now know and love. And Marilyn wasn't the only mother who left her children outside while shopping. On that day there were three or four carriages parked outside with babies inside them. I was born a lot later than this and in the small town I grew up in it was quite common to be left in the car even at parties. So my mother would go to a party and I would just be in the car by myself at different times. And that was when I was about four or five. So just, yeah, different times. And especially in uh, smaller towns, I think people trust everyone. And, you know, now I don't know that a lot of people would do this, but I'm sure there are still people that do. And I've heard in Europe, uh, I think it's Sweden or Scandinavia, um, that, or is it France? Oh, geez, my memory, it's going. Um, I think it's still common in a lot of places that they leave the carriages outside while uh, people go inside to shop. So Marilyn spent about 10 minutes in the supermarket on that day and she came out with a loaf of bread. Pamela, the baby, the stroller and Stephen were gone. Marilyn's initial thought was that Stephen, who was nearly three, had pushed the baby carriage home. So she went home to check if he and Pamela were there, which they weren't. She later stated that she didn't believe he could push the stroller and also said that he never wanders, he's kind of a mama's boy. About 15 minutes later, a neighbour of Jerry and Marilyn's found the stroller abandoned at the back of the store with baby Pamela inside. She was unharmed, but the straps holding her into the pram had been undone. Inside the baby carriage were the jelly beans that Stephen had been given. Now Marilyn called the police and because she was distraught she had to be taken to hospital to be treated for shock. A search party was organised and police officers took Marilyn through the streets where she used the megaphone to call, Stevie, where are you? Eventually, between two and 5,000 police, firefighters, Air Force personnel, scouts and locals formed a search party, but Stephen wasn't found. And after 28 hours at 6.30pm on 1st of November, Assistant Chief Inspector Leslie Pearsall called off the search and he stated that Stephen had been kidnapped. It seems odd to me that they made this statement so quickly in such a short period of time for searching, but again, it was different times. The police 
believed that Stephen had been abducted and it was theorised that maybe someone had lost a child and in their grief wanted to replace that child with another. Of course there were also more sinister theories that Stephen had been abducted by a sexual predator. To be honest, I don't buy the theory that Stephen was taken to replace a child as he was nearly three and it would be difficult to pass him off as a child that others knew, depending on their circumstances, obviously. I can see a baby being taken, but not a toddler. I can understand though a predator taking a toddler and leaving a baby, and I'm sure back then there were also a lot of black market adoptions, but in that case it still would be more likely that Pamela was taken and not Stephen. I'd love to know what you guys think. The day after Stephen went missing, the Vietnam War started on the 1st of November 1955 and it possibly distracted the news media of the time, but maybe it was just peripheral because the US involvement wasn't until later in the 1950s, early 60s. and. I'm curious to know, though, the impact on the media and coverage of this case in 1955 in the US, if anyone knows out there. Initially, there were some witnesses who claimed a team of four black people had been acting suspiciously, with one acting as a lookout, but there were no real leads in this, and another witness claimed to have seen six people pick up the boy from in front of the supermarket, but again, that just went nowhere. If it was a kidnapping, a ransom demand should have been made. And if it was an abduction, you would have thought that with the widely circulated information, that there would be some leads or sightings that would lead to actually real evidence. But days turned into weeks, and it wasn't until late November that a ransom note was received by the Diamonds. The kidnapper wanted $3,000, which is about $30,000 nowadays. And before the demands could be made, which the Dammons wanted to comply with, the kidnappers sent another two ransom demands, one for $10,000 and then one for $14,000. Now, the family had received a number of similar demands, but these ones actually had a monetary amount. And it would be very odd for a kidnapper to wait so long before making a ransom demand. Oh, that wind is picking up so much now, it's unbelievable. I hope you guys aren't hearing it too much. What's really sad is that for every heartbreaking situation, there's always people out there that prey on people who are involved in tragedies and it's really shocking if I was in charge they would be thrown in the slammer so fast their head would spin but anyway I'm not so probably a good thing um, the Dammons turned over all the letters to the police but none of them were genuine and Jerry Dammon actually believed that they were hoaxes but he still wanted to comply with the demand but it turns out he was right it was all a hoax the kidnapper turned out to be a college student and I couldn't find out if they were charged or not, but I hope so. And I really hope someone threw the book at them for wasting police resources, but also getting the hopes of the family up and only to be let down. It's a terribly cruel thing to do that. Uh, Jerry and Marilyn appeared on TV. They appealed for help, letting the public know that Stephen also needed medical attention for anemia and that he needed to take medication like vitamins, aspirin and tonic, but nothing prescriptive by the sounds of it. And it seems like it was done to not only raise public awareness, but maybe to extract some sympathy from the would-be kidnappers. In any event, no concrete leads turned up from the TV appeals. A few months after Stephen's disappearance, Jerry left the Air Force and he and his wife and daughter returned to Iowa. Now, I'm sure they must have had good reasons for doing this, but it seems odd as generally in missing persons cases, people stay in the same home for years often, uh, for the rest of their life sometimes, waiting for their child to return. 
Uh, Jerry's father had a farm in Iowa and that's where the family settled. Over the years there have been sightings of Stephen from all parts of America and Stephen had a couple of distinguishing features like a scar on his chin, a birthmark that resembled a mole on the back of his left calf and he also had a healed fracture to his left arm. He walked with his toes uh, turned out at the time of his disappearance and at the time of his disappearance according to some resources as well as having the anemia he was also being treated for a growth on his kidney so maybe in later years he might also need treatment for that as well. But even though the police investigated, none of the sightings turned out to be Stephen. Jerry and Marilyn's marriage was on the rocks before the disappearance of Stephen, but it seems that Jerry did blame Marilyn to some extent. I've read on Reddit, the, so I'm not sure of the accuracy of the source, that Jerry had asked Marilyn not to leave the children outside when shopping, so if that's true, it no doubt added to the conflict that was already there in the marriage. The marriage broke down and Marilyn filed for divorce in 1957 on the basis of cruelty, which uh, before, you know, irreconcilable differences and uh, different changes in divorce legislation, you know, it was really one of the most common grounds and it doesn't actually mean that the other person was cruel Jerry has said over the years that the marriage didn't break down due to the loss of Stephen, but Marilyn's temperament, which predated Stephen's disappearance. Marilyn was granted the divorce on 3rd of January 1958, and she remarried two months later. She also gained custody of Pamela. Her second marriage, though, didn't work out either, and she divorced him not long after in 1959 and I believe she remarried one more time but in 2013 Marilyn died. Jerry also remarried and he remained on the family farm in Iowa growing uh, I think corn and beans on this 300 acre farm which he took over from his father. He had more children as well with his second wife and he just basically settled into a life of farming. Over the years, many people have theorised that Stephen Darman was the boy in the box. And the boy in the box is the still unidentified, badly injured boy found in a cardboard box on the 25th of February 1957 in Philadelphia. Now he was estimated to be between three and four years old. And the idea is that someone abducted Stephen and held him for some period of time and then he was injured or killed, who knows, and became the boy in the box two years later. Stephen had a scar on his chin and the boy in the box had an L-shaped scar on his chin. And although the police were really optimistic, the identity of the boy in the box will be solved quickly, they were wrong. And in 1998, the boy in the box was exhumed and examined, and it was found that he didn't have a fractured arm like Stephen, and a DNA test confirmed that he wasn't a match for Pamela. So to this day, the identity of the boy in the box is still unknown, but it's not Stephen Damon. In 2009, the hopes were raised yet again when a man named John Barnes came forward, believing that he was Stephen Damon. And when looking at John with photos of Stephen as a baby and age progression images, there is a striking similarity. Not only that, John had always felt that he didn't belong in his family and he didn't believe that his biological parents were his parents. He thought that they had either kidnapped him or there'd been a baby switch in the hospital, but he just didn't have this feeling of belonging. And what started as like a hobby of his to look at missing person cases eventually landed him on Stephen Damon's case and it all seemed to come together for him. They were strikingly similar in appearance. He also had what looked like a faded scar on his chin 
And he actually contacted Jerry and Pamela, and Jerry said it would be nice to find out if he, being Stephen, was alive after all those years, because it's been a very hard time. And he said that he had given up hope that he would find out what happened to his son, but this new lead uh, had given him a glimmer of hope, and after all those years, you partially give up. You kind of figure that it won't be solved after all is said and done. John was actually born the same year as Stephen, and he'd only ever glimpsed his birth certificate once, which kind of made him more suspicious. He also had that faint mark on his chin, which could be a faded scar like Stephen's. And he got to know both Jerry and Pamela and the Damon family really well, and they all felt close to him and felt that he could be Stephen. And the FBI thought that the claim was worth investigating, and they conducted DNA analysis on John with Pamela's DNA, but unfortunately it was not a match. It must have been incredibly disappointing for the Damon family after all those years. And I also feel incredibly sorry for John, feeling that he was not part of a family and finally resolving this in his mind, only to find out that that was not the case. So the family of John Barnes were also incredibly upset and they insisted that John was their biological child. Uh, his sister Cheryl said at the time he pretty much lost two families today and I really hope they've managed to work things out and that John is happy in his skin nowadays but unfortunately he's not Stephen Damon. Jerry died in 2020 without ever having closure on where Stephen was. Now one of the theories that I haven't mentioned yet is that Stephen was not kidnapped. Some people wonder if Stephen was at the shops that day at all and if he ever left the house even. A neighbour of the family in her 80s recorded a video on YouTube recalling Stephen's broken left arm. He cried a lot. Um, she said that Stephen always seemed sad. He used to sit on the steps with his head down. And she believed that Marilyn had been abusing Stephen and maybe things got out of hand. In the 1950s, it was a different time and maybe Marilyn had postnatal depression and needed help. Maybe a child that was unwell was too much of a strain and there was not enough support for families and mothers back then. The neighbour's husband actually reported this alleged abuse to the Air Force chaplain and Stephen's father was called in uh, to see the chaplain at his work and he told him to mind his own business and to tell the neighbours to do that as well. Uh, the neighbour also said the Air Force and the police were looking for Stephen after he went missing, including the chaplain that the abuse had been reported to. And she was basically saying, you know, I told you so, I told you that this was going to happen. Uh, she also recalled that the house had a sickly smell to it. And she asked a nurse about the smell, who said it smelled of death. Now, as all these years have passed, I cannot find any records to confirm the statements by the neighbour. And it seems that even after all this time, that she is deeply affected by the disappearance of Stephen. Her theory is that the Parkway Road system was being built at the time, and Stephen may be buried there. And you can watch her video at the link below and see if you can make sense of it. It's very hard to uh, understand and hear because there's a lot of background noise. But if you're interested in hearing the whole lot, the link to it will be below this video. I'm unsure on this. I mean, evidence that comes out, you know, 50 odd years later, it always makes me question the validity of it because there's nothing to corroborate it. There's, you know, people have passed away and died and memories when they're taken at the time are often fresher. But often by the same token, people sometimes don't want to say anything so they don't report it and then 
they hope that someone else will step forward and then when that doesn't happen years go past and then they ultimately you know come out with a statement doesn't seem to be any record that she told the police of her suspicions and also no record that the house of the Dammons that they were living in was searched at the time but there well could be but due to the elapse of time you know maybe those records have been destroyed by now now another theory is that the general belief was that due to the location of where the pram was found that Stephen couldn't have pushed that there himself he'd have to go through like a lot of pedestrian traffic and he'd have to go over rough uneven ground and some people do believe though that Stephen did push the stroller and then perhaps got distracted or wandered away. It doesn't seem likely though that a toddler would not be noticed wandering the streets of a small town and the waterways, the parks and all the areas of this town were searched. But you know search parties have missed things before. So it seems unlikely but you know maybe it was misadventure maybe he wandered off and is around somewhere in uh, East Meadow Long Island so as at today's day in 2021 Halloween Stephen Dammon has not been found it's been over 65 years and only his sister Pamela remains Personally, I'd love to see a story where Stephen Dammon had been brought up by a loving family, was found, identified and reunited with his sister. Personally, though, I don't think that's going to happen, but maybe Stephen's remains will be found and can be given a proper burial and closure for his sister. As well as Stephen's sister and the investigators that continue to work this case, there are many other people that are invested in Stephen's case that are really affected by it, like the neighbour. Uh, I'm sure everyone would love to know what happened to him. I'd love to know what you think and any theories that you may have as well. If you do have any details, I'll put the details of the Nassau County Police Department and the missing person number below the video as well as I'll put up on screen now a age progression picture of what Stephen could possibly look like if he was still alive right now but I'd love to hear what your theories are I just can't imagine a case that has gone on for so long with just so little results which personally makes me feel that Stephen is not around but I'd love to be wrong on it and I know a lot of people will be very negative towards Marilyn leaving the children outside the store but uh, I've seen pictures of this with line up of and I, of course I can't find where I've seen it um, <laughs> with a line up of prams right outside the shop where just women left them there and in small towns you know that's what was done and yeah, I certainly remember when I was a kid it was you were just left outside and I've spoken to David and it's the same sort of thing it's different times but I can imagine like uh, Madeline McCann's parents and they left their children alone while they went for dinner that people will be very harsh on it but really it only takes two seconds you know for something to happen and what seemed like a good idea at the time just all goes downhill in just seconds but anyway I would love to know what you guys think do you think Stephen was kidnapped or abducted do you think he's alive 